interaction with the outside oh, environment. Interaction, interaction. Yeah, yeah. So at the high level, you are either zero or one in the computer, you are in this, right? It's either zero or one. At that level, in quant, you can be zero and one simultaneous. Super, two states. Super, what do you call it? Super imposition? Super imposition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they are in a state of superimposition at all temperature, right? It doesn't change anything by bringing what, up. If it is switching between zero and one, which one are you going to lock it in? Yeah. That's the point. Oh, the point I see. is if it is simultaneously zero and one, are you yes or no simultaneously? So if it's absolutely near absolutely zero, we can determine the. The, we can bring down all of this. Yeah, you have to lock it into either zero or one, and that's the challenge. If it was resolved already, we would have yeah, got some computers sitting all over the world. But we can't. <laughs> IBM and CERTS, what is that? CERTS? CERTS. 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 And in fact, he said, superconductor, that's where you want them to be really moving so that you go to and achieve that superconductor state. And here is the different challenges, like retain the state so that you can define the state and you can make something out of that, which is the frustration in quantum mechanics and quantum theory. How to retain that state. It's both the frustration and at one last point, it's also the advantage. That's yeah. why it makes it like even more kind of faster to solve uh, that kind of problem. And this is the idea of superpositioning. Yeah, I, I think superpositioning is one of the most mind blowing stuff. And probably after I do my little talk on superpositioning, I'd like to hear your um, thoughts on superpositioning. But in that video, right, um, the researcher was telling the little child if you spin that coin, right, while it's in motion, it's, you can't, unless you stop it, then you can define that state, right? So, you know, we, we're only binary in, in our real life, right? Zeros or ones, yes or no, true or false. There could only be one option, but to have two possible options at any given point in time, saying physically in the physical world that we live in, it's mind blowing. What do you think about superposition? Uh, well, for me, superposition is uh, actually pretty straightforward and very simple. Yeah. <laughs> but mind blowing. The, the, the only thing is about superposition is that uh, you have an unknown state, an unknown state basically entropy has, you know, you know you measure entropy at one, and then you collapse it to a certain state and your entropy goes to zero because you know the state. And entropy is of Shannon entropy as of uh, measurement of unknown information. Um, the interesting part about superposition though is that uh, when let's say you create um, well, particles are created, of course, and destroyed, right? So we all, all agree with that. Right? And uh, assuming that a particle uh, was created in a certain, well, it's not created in a certain state, that's the whole point. It's created in all possible states. And when we measure it, we measure it in a certain state. But it happens at the time of the measurement, not at the time of the creation, and that's why the superposition is actually interesting. And the best problem is Demonstration for it uh, would be, uh, I forget the name again, I don't remember names, but uh, Dirac was it? Uh, I don't remember who was, who was it, but um, let's say Mr. Plato. If we two polarizers, one 90 degrees, another 90 degrees, whatever, send the photo to 45 degrees, for example, I mean polarization twice, to those two polarizers, nothing would go through, or any polarization of the photo, nothing would go through because one would cancel another. However, if you introduce another polarizer in between those two polarizers, 90 degrees, at other angle, like average angle, but not at the same, the photon would all of a sudden go through. How is that possible? But uh, actually, if you do unitary uh, transformations on each polarizer, just you know, just using you know two by two matrices for each polarizer corresponding, and, and the original state of the photon, let's say photon is uh, one over two, one over two, for example, in the, in the Hadamard and the and then you have a uh, polarizer which would be 1, 0, 0, 0, and another one would be 0, 0, 0, 1. And then in the intermediate matrix, you would use the angle, whatever that is. You compute actually, like even on paper, that uh, in the result, you have something rather than nothing. Meaning that you would get a photon go through. Um, that uh, three gates, basically. 
because each polarizer you can assume is a quantum gate and uh, quantum is a qubit, right? I just so thought there's probably only one other person in the room who's following you. Yeah. <laughs> Everything's going over my head, oh, being sorry. honest. <laughs> no, no, that's fine. Oh, this, okay. this, is, this is such a fascinating field, but it's also a complicated field. You don't have this hardcore PhD theoretical I, 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 no, I, I actually, you know what, I studied cosmology. I can talk about black holes much more than I can talk about quantum <laughs> but, uh, or, or the universe solution in general, because that's what I studied. Uh, but that was back a long time ago in the 80s, and unfortunately, you know, all cosmology changed since then several times, and now we're talking about holographic principles, stuff, I'm not going to go there. Um, or anti-decidural space. Uh, but uh, entanglement is much more interesting, in my opinion, than superposition. And actually, Zinni fact will be the other thing that is also interesting in, in, as far as the uh, quantum computing concerned, and so it's kind of uh, different post measurement uh, thing. But entanglement is also easily explained through entropy rather than uh, rotating coins or anything like that. Basically, uh, entanglement stands for the, the entropy of particle A. Let's say, well, let's say it's one, right? That's the state, so the entropy is one. And, and, and particle B is one, but their uh, entropy together is not two, but less than two. How is that? It's because due, to, due to entanglement, right? So the entanglement really is erasing of information and uh, of that quantum system, of multi-particle quantum system, from the environment perspective. Because when we talk about observer in quantum mechanics in general, we're not talking about the person looking at it or you know us sending microwave pulses or anything like that. The environment itself, the universe itself, is an observer. So anything that can interact with that quantum system becomes an observer, automatically it would collapse the way power may not work, but it would definitely affect the state. So, and... I think there's a question back to you. But yeah, so I have a question about uh, the application of entanglement within quantum computing. So, so what would be something useful, you know, for this property? Would it be like data redundancy? So, Communication. Um, uh, classical computers, made of gates. You have, uh, you know, but the main gate that you're really interested in classical co computing is a um, C not gate, controlled not gate, right? Or controlled any gate, right? Any controlled gate in classical computer is very important. So you cannot build a quantum uh, controlled gate without entanglement. You have to have an entanglement to build that gate. That's why it's so interesting. Because without it, you cannot have a, a controlled gate. And controlled unitary gate, so not necessarily uh, not gate, but um, I mean, controlled X gate, controlled Y gate, controlled Z gate, controlled. Um, and uh, what is the gate really, and how you describe the gate? You describe the gate by a uh, YouTube group, basically. Um, so you just do just simply al algebra in the YouTube group. And all this two by two matrices, the complex matrices that would have uh, basically uh, not four but eight uh, independent variables, right? Because it's like, uh, you know, it costs also i and like x plus i, whatever, y, whatever. You want to call those, and there's four of them. So you have a total of eight independent numbers. And so that's a YouTube group. And uh, you start really understanding quantum computing, in my opinion, by learning Lie algebra, at least the YouTube group. And like, and like you start with SO2 group, and then you upgrade yourself to YouTube group, and then you kind of know what to do, how the quantum gates would work. So now, to build a CNOT gate, you need not two by two matrix, but four by four matrix, because you have that your uh, one qubit interacting with another qubit, right? And the first qubit would be basically just a standard um, I gate, which is identity, so it's one, one, zero, zero. And then the other gate, NOT gate, would be zero, zero, one, one, or, or diagonal, or it could be any U matrix, right, uh, in that position. And we ignore those two matrices on, uh, I mean, two by two matrices on each uh, of diagonal side. And that's basically uh, why entanglement you really need in order to build any computer, because without single gate, I don't know how to build a computer. Question about the matrices, right? Are you talking about what exactly? Are you talking about data or are you talking about the qubits themselves on the matrix? I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the matrices as, like, how would you represent mathematically any gate, okay. and so I'm representing the gate so by like, the matrix. Like I have some code up here, right?
right? So this is one type of gate, uh, a control not gate, right? Yes. So if you want to write the matrix for it, you would write 1, 1, 0, 0. All those two matrices are all zeros. And uh, the bottom right matrix, the 2 by 2, would be because they don't do it really explicitly. In, um, that's the IBM wire, all right? One, I, I used it a little bit. So I'm kind of familiar with it. Um, they don't really write you out the matrix and when you do the Python thing. But if you go to the IBM side from the SQ experience uh, so, and go to each gate, they actually show you the corresponding matrix for each gate. So let's, well, let's just kind of walk through. So I wrote this code like a year ago, so this is forcing me to revisit it. Um, actually, apology yesterday was just like, hey. I'm sorry, what is this code written for? So, all right, quick question. Uh, is this a myth or not? What? If you don't have access to a quantum computer, can you use quantum computers? They're available on the quantum Exactly, so they're available by API. So IBM has a quantum experience API, so it's very easy to set up in minutes and you have access to a quantum computer right then and there through the APIs, which is great. Mm. Yeah. Um, so, let's see, so this thing is a quantum thing. You, or your quantum circuits register, whatever. All right, so here, the quantum register. Do you know what quantum register is? Well, quantum register will be basically a qubit, or, uh, or, or, like it's or a the, oh, basically the origin. It's, uh, so each, any quantum system consists of, of, of three separate parts. It's the first is preparation, when you prepare your quantum state, uh, or you can be ground state or whatever. Then you allow the system to freely evolve, um, you know, the call sharing the revolution, you know, in time uh, to a new state. And then the third part is when you measure that state, the final state. So when you find out what the computation really was. And that's, uh, that's any quantum system. So the register would be your preparation. So you have to prepare the system, you define the registers, then, uh, then you run the computation plot plot, which is the free evolution. And then you measure those states that come uh, out. So the probably easiest uh, uh, thing that you can build very easily is that IBM quantum computer is like a quantum free edge spot. That would be the uh, you know like kind of the classic example. So something analogous to the uh, program that you have written here would be if anyone remembers programming assembly on an 8285 bar rotary machine. This, this program is much more analogous to that, where you had to prepare the bits and you had to add, you had to address each bit that you worked on. It's it's analogous. That's how I I can relate to what has been here. Yeah. Uh, so a little yeah. question here. I really my answer here is we always need to figure out if we go into the system design and uh, if we use the, the quantum computing the ideas the concept here. What is that? Really, the layers that we need to to separate, and it's like the here. So the gentleman mentioned that here, so we need to run the, the low temperature so environment, and yeah. then so going to manipulate the gates, and yeah, that's probably is on the chip side level, right? So, so yeah, that's exactly. what you say. It's like the, a summer cold. So yeah, here. this is and, it's, and it go up, and yeah. they have some API for really the, like the middle. Yeah, this is cool. So, so the, what you're seeing here is the abstraction uh, into an API layer of the assembly language required to produce that gate. Mm -hmm. What this does in the back end is it, it compiles into a proprietary language, assembly language by IBM or CASM or quantum assembly as they call it, right? Right. So um, actually if you open up the IBM Q uh, UI, uh, oh, you, right. you, you can, can uh, interact uh, uh, through right, right, right. the gates, you can lock in some gates on the circuit uh, composer and see how it works, right? What Qiskit does is it provides an abstraction API layer to uh, generate the uh, chasm code behind the scenes and lock it into the uh, IBM Q. Right, so why try and understand if Several people work in that software environment area. Mm -hmm. So the people actually, like say here, so if I work in uh, database area, okay. uh, how I need to change my my 
I'm stuck. And libraries, I think, I like to call it I think where we are today is very far for us to even think about some real world application like a database programming perspective in, in our patch, right? Um, so this is more um, going back to prior to when Intel was started probably, right? when, when you had a bunch of assembly language stuff that you could do uh, quickly with your uh, PLC uh, logic. That's the state we are in. So, so what is a quantum computer are really good for? I mean, is there any specific, specific problem that is really good for? So, what is a benefit in that? The same picture would be a good specific problem that one yes. would do. Because it can so then you are way ahead of us. Just slow down a little bit. What is the main benefit of quantum computing? You can uh, factorize, for example, large prime numbers very fast. In All example. right. So, so finding the prime number. I mean, but other than that, you know. So, because, because uh, yeah. use for RSA keys. I mean, prime numbers. RSA keys. Right, right. I I know those those are well known facts. So right. Let's just say shot two fifty six. Yeah. That's that's why it's pretty hard. I mean, that, that you can do using many GPU functions, right? What? Yeah. SHA 256. SHA 256. Oh, oh, the, the, the decryption. If you have good GPU functions, you, you, can, okay. you can break that problem. So, um, the, the. Right, I'm not quite saying like. Okay, so go on. The power of quantum computer, like, because of the many states that are uh, accessible in the qubit, right? Right. Um, the, uh, the real power comes in. Um, manipulating or computing big data sets, if you will. That's one example sure. because the quantum computer is described as two to the power n. Right. And it's not the um, it, it, it's not the binary logic. It's it's the n power of two. So when you are reaching um, two to the after it passed two to the power four, right? A classical and quantum computer. But how do we decide what is the limit of the n? That's the number of qubits. The number of qubits. Do you, you want to come up here and do a demonstration of this? Um, I haven't done this recently, so. I can, I can do it for you. I don't know. I mean, it's pretty. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, you could explain that as I set it up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is an off the cuff presentation. Today. Yeah. Uh, so, how many of this would be? Right? It's five. Okay. Um, So the real power is that uh, you can provide. Yeah, the real power is you one one area where you can um, take off because it the turns amount of, the amount of data that you can process at a given instance. So it's capable of processing massive amount of data. Yes. So, yes. so it's perfectly solution for yes. for machine so, learning or artificial deep learning or yes. yes. training yes. model. Yeah. Okay. So today in today's world, right? Uh, all the machine learning practitioners out here know uh, since we are uh, limited with the uh, computational power, right? Uh, we break down the um, networks into subsections, if you will. You have layers upon layers right, upon right, right. Uh, layers of simple um, matrix calculations being performed repetitively to to learn a particular feature, if you will, on a, on a Train, image, right, yeah, right. on a image processing example, right? For right, right. if you if this you have sense, a, this is what I was trying to jump in and yeah. explain to you before. So, like machine learning and deep learning, pro like processes within their modules and under the hood stuff. There's a lot, a lot of matrices, and this is where the optimization solutions come in from quantum computing, so they can speed this up radically. Yeah. So. One of the reasons why uh, the machine learning algorithms are built the way they are today 
is because of the available compute power, right? Uh, you literally have to break down portions of your data set and throw it to computational uh, areas. Right, right, get the result right. back and then reprocess them in a certain way. Right, right. That's why the you know think, all think of think of a notion when you know the best you, uh, registers you have are sixty four bit today, right? right? And if you add on GPU, I mean, if you think of a single chip with sixty four bits that you have today, right? right? And if you add GPU farms, then you uh, well, the address space, space. The address space. The address space is 64. Is, yeah. right. On any address. Space, the address space is 2 to the power 64. But since on a quantum computer, the addressable space uh, takes the form of 2 to the power n, right? Once you cross 5 qubits, if you perform 2 to the power 8, the amount of data that you can process on those registers becomes significantly higher than a class. Wait, wait, right, like I said, right now, I mean, Intel or any other mm -hmm. can have a 64 bit. Yeah. So I can, 2 raised to the 64, that's the total amount of addressing state. No, not on a classical computer, you do not have 2 to the power 64. On a quantum computer, you will get 2 to the power 64. If you have a 64 qubit quantum computer, you will get to 2 to the power 64. Right, 2 to raised to the power 64. But in classic computer, like I say, I have a 64 address space, huh? 64 bit, which is the common, right? Very common right now, right? Yeah, you don't have that that many address space available for to hold the data. Right. You you do some bits, you lose the map and everything else. That's what is happening here. So that's that's one area where why uh, your computations could be sped up. So. Uh, maybe you can show an example yeah. and walk through it and I think uh, it'll, it'll make more sense, you know, because this stuff uh, easy to go over your head if you don't see things in front of you.
Hi, the mark is 1 over square root of 2, 1, 1, 1, minus 1. Yeah, there we go, the fact. Yeah, talk about addition. Yeah, so uh, these are some of the gates that are made available uh, for us, and whatever uh, IBM has implemented, which, are, which they can vouch for in a stable state today. Right? Um, it will be working on other stuff. So, for example, um, why I was relating to assembly language earlier is I wrote a simple circuit program to add two numbers 10 and 10. Circuit circuit composite. Yes. But, uh, so your your goal is to just add 10 plus 10? Yeah, my goal is to just add 10 plus 10 and it should produce 20. Right? So what do they call composer? Is that because this is kind of like compiler? This is, uh, uh, no, this is a UI based uh, tool, right? So behind the scene, uh, this is an abstract of the math that is occurring behind the scene, this X gate. X is a polymatrix, X polymatrix, which looks like 0, 1, 1, 0. That's what it does. Y being the, uh, what is it, 0, I, minus I, 0 is the Y, and the C is 0, 1, 1, minus 1, zero, right? So if okay. you, yes. yeah, if you went back to the assembly relationship of this particular circuit diagram out here, this is what it would take to generate the circuit to add two numbers 10 and 10. Right? So, they, uh, I mean, I'm not in any means promoting IBM, so <laughs> don't, don't confuse me for that, but they've made the tool available. Uh, it's free to register. And free to play with, but you have access to just five few websites, which is very limiting in what you can do. But it's a great starting point to learn. Why are you speaking? Can you just tell us a little bit about what your company is doing? I, mean, I, I try to find out what's applicable. What is the super, uh, quantum computing? What is their main benefit? What's the you know? What kind of application they can so do? So theoretically, because of because of what I stated earlier of the uh, number of addressable space that you have. Right. It's, it's projected that uh, the current computationally hard problems which require capability to crunch big amounts of data, right. Right? Um, like molecular uh, modeling for example, right? and also material, uh, material modeling, right? mm -hmm. such kind of problems, A, because of the addressable space that is available, and B, because of the number of states that a qubit or qubits can exist. So um, you, um, you approach it in a way where um, if you want to be analogous to a maze, right? Today, if five people were to enter a maze. Enter what? A maze, maze to get out of, oh. right? Um, you, we would all look at one possible solution at a time, right? right? We would take one route, test it out if that is possible for us to get out of that maze. If that doesn't work, we we take a next best route we think is possible, right? right. But because of the uh, the address space available and because of uh, features like entanglement and superposition, right? It is possible for a quantum computer to look at all possible solutions at the same time and go into a ground state which is closer to the solution. So that's what makes the computational capability faster. And that's one weird quantum mechanics stuff. I'm not a <laughs> quantum, quantum physicist, so don't ask me how that works, but that's what I was learned from exposure to the quantum computer. Yes. Uh, very good question. Did, so did you generate um, that schematic of, of all those uh, gate uh, so how do you generate or you just pass out the operation and it generates that? Uh, uh, which one? This all these plus signs and this oh, one? Yeah. So I, I initially wrote uh, a program in Kiskit, right? Um, the stuff that you were showing. So you write the software program and it generates. Yeah, right. I wrote so the software programs. Program. So the, the code I was showing before, like one line of code was like a circuit composer. Yeah. This is a visual representation of composer. 
So you can do it multiple ways, right? I mean, um, the, the API provides you a much easier way for us programmers to deal with it. I mean, if you were to ask me to write a circuit diagram like this, I so would it is kind of like, it is kind of like, do you think of it kind of like barrel log for for Potentially, yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Can you run this? Yeah. <laughs> is, is that I think is that actually one of the advantages of quantum computing is like doing parallel operations as so like you don't think sequentially you think yeah it's more the, the parallelism is uh, easier. but it's not correct it's a time yeah. evolution so it's yeah. always happens in time so there is there is always certain time that it will take yeah. even though that time is and actually this is the time on horizontal line right. and. Those gates are sequential. They don't really happen I've, at I've the same time. I've got a question for well. like a very, very simple example like this. Ten plus pi. I, I, it I, could it could run faster in Python, it, not not exactly, pi, right? Exactly right. So, uh, I mean, th whatever I've done here is basic uh, stuff for me to learn the science behind it, right? It's it's not admissible to use a quantum computer for such a, a stupid operation, so, right? Like, I, think, um, I think maybe we can kind of talk about like what all this stuff means. I have some idea, right? It's like that one line of code, this is the representation of a whole composer. Okay. And correct me if I'm wrong, these are the qubits. Yes, right? so yes. Qubits, so. these are the qubits. Um, so out here, right, when, um, when in your uh, kiss kit you said um, add register, quantum register with Five, you would have added a quantum register with Q1, Q2 out here, right? Uh, Think of defining variable in C++, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, and that would translate to this particular register, Q1, being available with five mm. qubits. I see. Oh, okay, okay. So, so similarly, is it this? So before we jump ahead, so this would be a registry? Yeah. So <laughs> this is a registry. Oh, that's a registry. Analog, I mean, I, it's not called a register per se in quantum computing uh, terms, but I'm just trying to be as analogous as possible for us. Right? Like the quiz so, yeah. so this would be a five bit register in, in a classical uh, computer, right? And this declaration would give you a six bit register in a classical computer. Yes. This Q2 set of Q2s, right? So that, that's how uh, it is. So that API, right, it, it first generates this particular circuit, and also IBM provides you uh, mechanisms to um, to get the assembly code behind the scenes, right, and that is this. You, you can actually directly write the assembly code if you're comfortable. Uh, I, I'd like to see this in action, if we could run it. Yes. So I, I haven't seen examples like this in anger. So, uh, Yes. So there is a C register and a Q register. What C register is? is the classical register. Yeah, that's what they use to show you the result. Yeah, Q register is the register that does all the calculation behind the scenes. Can you convert this to like a graphics, like a board graphic or something? This Sorry. is the graphic. <laughs> this is the graphic, yeah. What is that right? It's, it's called a graphical a representation. It's called quantum circuit diagram. Just call it graph. Graph. Official term. Okay, so it's submitted. It's currently they allow you to submit uh, instructions on, in, in a batch mode, right? right? So you're waiting in a queue until yeah. your task goes. So that's how it's free. It's not like if I execute something. It'll get processed right then and there. They're, it's free for all the researchers and people, but it's still relatively fast. Yeah, you, you can't complain. Can't complain. Yeah, come back to the punch card game that used to some this attack and then the third will come in. <laughs> 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 so, yeah, then you display the original. So, this is all based on probability, right? So, if you measure this particular register state, you get 20. Right. Yeah, this, uh, this came up with a 100% probability. Of the result being accurate. 100% probability that you had a 10 plus 10? Is, yeah. Is 100% 10, 10 plus 10, no, not, not that 10 plus 10 was added with 100% probability. The measurement 
resulted. Sometimes you see another state where you know your probability for this particular result set is not actually 100 percent, but it is higher right. than the remainder for some reason, and that is attributed more to the noisy states that the quantum computers are in today. Okay, and that's what we call as being in the niskara. So, so by, by show of hands, I just want to know who here like works directly with quantum APIs in their day-to-day -day work. You, a little bit. Okay, so I mean, I think where we want to have the discussion from here is like use cases, you know? So we talked about a bit about encryption, talked a little about machine learning and deep learning. Um, I'm really interested in computer vision, you know, processes and image classification or whatever. So, the, I mean, computer vision and image classification, those mainly fall into the category of your ML AI algorithms, right? Any, any speed up that you would get um, from, a quantum, from using a quantum computer would in AI ML applications, that would be generated to a vision of any other application. So, like, I got a question. Do you mainly, mainly program in Python? Python? For this, uh, they have released the uh, SDK for Python, and since I'm more comfortable with Python, I just use Python. Cool. Okay, so I mean, you know NumPy, right? So that's where all the matrix multiplication yeah. happened. And so I mean, like, what at the end of the day, how it's really used in the industry today is you pull in these APIs, and it's just going to speed up matrix multiplication, and that's found in like every ML deep learning, you know, AI modules. And uh, since quantum computers are basically based on the principles of linear algebra, right? Um, usage of a tool like NumPy is right. more I recommend it. Linear vectors, yeah. matrices. Yeah. 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 I mean, in the arena of AI, ML, and we, we have edge computing here, obviously. Because we so, yeah, I am an IoT practitioner as well. Right. right. And that's where I'm coming at. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Which I to hear was, and we were talking about simultaneous processing. Yes. Multi state processing. Now, when it comes to autonomous cars, and when you have so much uh, activity around, so many signal sensors, they're all capturing the information where you need to take that instant decision. I mean, we have read about certain cases where Tesla failed, mm -hmm. it didn't take the right action, and there were other consequences. But as I see this emerging, now, I think this is a very beautiful depiction here. Even in the very first hour when I'm sitting here with you guys, like so. But the wow. the the, the how can I blend the two yeah. together? Yeah. So I would say the only limitation uh, for that is the availability of a general purpose quantum computer in a size that would fit in a car. Right. 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 And right. that's where I was coming at. Yeah. Yes. So with that. Already we see the kind of price differential between like yeah, I mean I'm not an industry expert on the yeah. hardware side, but what I've heard is so we are probably that's about, we, we are probably heard the frustration. Yeah, what I've heard mean. is we're probably about twenty years away. What? And, and it could be it could be what? more, it could be less depending yeah. on how things compress or uh, that yeah, in terms of resourcing all of that. You did you say twenty years away? That's what I've heard from being able to uh, have a general purpose commercialized uh, commercialized one. So this, everybody is um, building an analogy where the very first vacuum tube computer ENIAC was, which was half, half of the full grade size, right? The, not the physical size itself, but uh, the availability and the technology that is needed to uh, maintain cubic coils. That's and and it's, it's the same thing, like the way we anticipated that whatever AI will take, mm -hmm. and how many years it will take, but with the moves you are getting extended from one year to beyond a year now for doubling the capacity. Yeah. And all that, now it is at a stage where it has already taken the first mode and it's there. Quantum could take 20, could take 15, could take 25. It's again the same scenario. This is kind of off the topic, but it's kind of a parallel subject. Um, so in terms of data storage, one of the things people are looking at is using uh, DNA and, and, and you know, genetic so molecules you, to you, store yeah, data. You, you know what? Is that also the same thing where it takes yeah. another 10 years to make that? I, I don't know. Like, it, 
interestingly enough, I read a paper about seven years ago that uh, people were exploring DNA computing paradigms, right? right? I haven't heard anything on that. Okay. If you want to do any studies on that, go to the University of Washington. Yeah, so yeah. they did some image processing using DNA. I read about yeah. that. Yeah. They might be at some, I think that's my lab, so they might be at some research. Oh, that's your lab. Approaching its limitation, right? So you have to find a better way to compute. Maybe this is the solution. But then the real question: How do you commercialize this technology? We're still far away. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but didn't he just really say that there's a there's an entity to make a claim by 2023? Yeah, they are dreams. Not that. Is that what happened? No. 
I can give this uh, what is I'm talking about this photo of student photos. The current state of art is like from University of Bristol. Two cubits they have entangled on the silica photo. So using silica photo. So that is the state of art. What? Can you say that again? Now you be like they have said that you need large number of cubits. Right. And this he has said that using photos. So I'm telling you using photons, what is the state of the art is two qubits have already been entangled. So you have got a qubit, some kind of computer at present. And you can use the state of the box. Uh, I, I hear what you say, but I, I don't really follow, to be honest with you. Now, present state of art is there are two kinds of computers actually. One is the general purpose is talking. That has reached up to 75 qubits. Another is the wave kind of computers. They have gone up to 2000 qubits. But that is a limited optimization kind of computer. For silicon photon, it's least early. That has reached up to, that using uh, two qubits only. So, uh, so, that portable 223 is because of that. And that is, has to reach up to. Okay. I hear you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I think there was a gentleman here who wanted to talk about autonomous vehicles. I don't know if he's still here. I was interested. Or I, I wanted to learn about it. I don't know if he's still here. Is he? I didn't see much of it. I, I he was he was like a, uh, working in the autonomous vehicle space. Mm -hmm. I don't know too much how I can share you material. Just add me on LinkedIn and I can share you material. I've already added you. You've already, oh, you've, you've already added. Okay, I'll, yeah, I'll send it to you. I'm sorry, you know. <laughs> you're busy. You just said you're already in the morning. Don't worry, that's all you are. So, yeah, I'll, I'll send down information to our uh, What I'll do is I'll put up the Google Drive. We'll, we'll have a shareable link. Biology already set up a Google Drive with a bunch of articles and research papers. We'll add to that and we can share the link with everyone. Um, so, like, people here, are they, are they anyone interested in, like, the startup space with quantum computing? Because I have, like, one idea. Um, so, like, you know, I think space is going to be huge, right? So, space exploration. And then, like, it's like, you know, it's like, it's many subject areas, right? So, you know, why is it, like, low levels and then, you know, the universe and I learned. So, I think the problem is the current are Use case, uh, use That's a very interesting question because I 
are following Mercedes-Benz, this place called Cruz, and also following Volvo and BMW, and none of them, none of them are pointing to quantum uh, computing. None of them, right. So they're all exercise because, simply because the form factor isn't there. Yes. I mean, what are they going to put it in, in a giant, you know, exactly. helicopter? <laughs> yeah, it's definitely not portable, and I mean, when Malaji was telling me earlier in the week about the small little device, but well, autonomous vehicles, I was like, what are you talking about? What? <laughs> and we were debating for like the past few days, we couldn't get on the same page, and I was like, I don't know, what are you talking I mean, about? I gotta find this so, out. So, but Balani, is, is, this, is this idea in fruition, or is it just the idea aspect that you're looking for? Yeah, I have an idea for uh, autonomous mandala. That's why I named this Q Mandala, because it is, uh, Mandala means in uh, Sanskrit, it is a design. So, the design, um, which I'm trying to see is like, uh, I mean, we, me and uh, Tony plan to start like a, I mean, a new level. Uh, if anybody interested to join, of course, uh, we need some more people to join as a startup, maybe. Mm. What is the area that you guys? I'm, I'm, I'm highly interested in financial applications, Monte Carlo simulations. I know people working right there, and I can write some code, make millions of dollars, I'd like to do that. Um, also, I think space exploration is huge. So what was the simulation that you were talking about? Since Monte Carlo simulation. simulation. That's the only real use case. I would say 80% of the real, real quantum use cases are in the hedge fund and investment bank and financial space. They're the only ones who have the capital, and the real, as of right now, the real intended use cases are probably use cases. You mean, so FinTech is the area? FinTech right now as we speak. Uh, right there's a heavy use case also security uh, area. Oh, oh yeah, the security area yeah. encryption is huge. Yeah, yeah. 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 the passport encryption is the other. Right. China and Russia and probably well, NSA are very much in. So this is interesting. So who follows Bitcoin? Me. So, oh, we have some blockchain people here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> blockchain. Uh, well, I, so blockchain, Bitcoin, that's built off of SHA-256. I, you know, if you ever see Bitcoin vanish, like out of thin air, I probably hacked it, all right? <laughs> 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 I don't know, so, you know, it's, you so have APIs so so readily accessible, and if, uh, well, that's a, hey, we could, we could just, you know, we could just put our heads together and really just crash Bitcoin if we want, you know? It's, it's around the corner, it's literally around the corner. Like, not even crash, like, take it out of existence, bring it to the void. Won't even exist because that's what these form principles do. Once they start interacting with something like so shot two fifty six groups of blockchain, huh? no more stuff. The blockchain. Well, I mean, it's, it's blockchain. So there's this one cryptocurrency I follow. It's called IOTA, and the reason why they're significant is they're the first uh, folks to incorporate SHA ten twenty four. So researchers are already ahead of the game in figuring out what's quantum encryption. So SHA-1024 is quantum proof. So IOTA yeah, is a currency. Yeah, yeah. We're going to I use the content. IOTA. I would say SHA-1024 is presented by the amount of computer power that exists in a farm to pay, right? Exactly. Um, so I don't want to go down to that. Say, I don't know. Look it up. I, we have to find out. Like, SHA 1024 too, like at what point? Because uh, of course this is evolution, right? People are just, it's interesting. So you say SHA 1024, that, that's a separate uh, block, blockchain system than the rest of well, it? Well, no, that's just secure hashing mechanism. Yeah, right? so um, the, the NSA first came up with SHA 256, and between you and me, NSA is probably the one who developed Bitcoin. So, yeah, they developed SHA 256, and um, it's pretty old technology. I can do that. So Ten years. One yeah. Curiosity question. Yeah. Are you technically invested in Bitcoin or financial? Oh, I have a long history of Bitcoin. I was in my seventh grade when it first came out. I followed it every day of my life. I made some very close friends of mine, multimillionaires. And I made some really good money. Ooh. and lost it to a Chinese scam. So when people talk about regulation, I think it's a great thing. Protects investors. I cried for a week because I lost half a million in two seconds. 
Wow. And it's, it's because I sold at the top when I was over 19,000. Yeah. I locked in all my profits. And then I got really greedy and selfish. And I was like, I want to short this goddamn thing. I sent money into this thing called the Wealth Club. It was a Chinese scam. I was sending money all over the place. Coinbase, Binance. I was just I trusted it during that time. And during that peak, holy crap. I didn't do my homework. It was a complete scam. I lost everything. You know, there is a correlation between the, 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 what you, the, the blockchain and the interest rate. So the, the, the whole market is collide when the Fed begin to raise the interest rate. The thing about it. So that means that it means it's manipulated. By it's a speculation. Right, and so that's why I it's, think- This is where they park the hot money. They borrow the money, they show the government bond and loan the blockchain. That so when you lost all that money uh, to the Chinese scam, you get to write it off to the IRS, right? <laughs> In your dream. <laughs> I don't know. I don't think, that, I don't think it works like that. If anything, I'd probably get 3000 I think that's a cap for losses. You put it in your tax return, Mr. the writer is coming after you. It's fine. It's really fast. No, because they'll find out anyway. So you have to show them out. The box, their, their, their technology is so back in the day that they have to acquire startups to keep track. They're, they're not going to find, find out who made money or not. Do you still play with the, you know, uh, this Bitcoin? No, or was it that? No? No, it's going to go quiet for a while and then I think it'll pick up. Unless I hack it and pick it up because it's yeah. oh, no, no, I, I can't stop at day 15 because we oh, that's the next and I, I don't think they're the best use of time. So maybe if you guys uh, want to do a follow-up one, we can do that. Or, I mean, you can talk. I mean, if people are here, I'm the Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm the one out of time. Yeah, right. is that? Okay. Yeah, you are talking about. Uh, Sorry, there's too many conversations going. What's what's your, what's your thought about? Are you going to have this regular meeting or is, yeah, is that something Balaji can answer? What's your question? You what, what you want talking about? Is that about mobile car? Yeah, that that's I'm. We are looking for. Oh uh, no, he's talking about AI and uh, recent uh, and classical one. Uh, AI and AI. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Classical yeah. one. I mean, not quantum. It's just. Uh, oh, oh, just a new topic. topic. That, that is the second topic. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Brief, yeah. Can you give a brief, you know, synopsis of what you're going to talk about? Uh, sure. So uh, about a day and a half, you guys reached out and said uh, you wanted to talk about AI, but more from a fundamental perspective. So what I did is I just grabbed uh, three papers that, that were published in 2019 and sort of take you from a fundamental approach and like once you've gathered data, how to extract knowledge from it. So I picked three, not knowing how much time I'm going to have, and I'll let you guys pick what you want to talk about. But there's a, a, a relatively new architecture that has uh, taken hold of that falls between RNNs and CNNs, if you guys are familiar with blocks. And those are known as transformers. So I thought if the crowd in general doesn't understand transformers, that's where the conversation is moving to next, which is known soft relationship across across lens. So the second one that I have is, is talking about so it'll be the next thing, now what? So RNNs, uh, LSTMs, oh, okay. CNNs, so so we'll and LSTMs. LSTMs. correct. Um, then I picked up another topic for you guys thinking it might be interesting would be if you guys are interested more into architecture, so transform is a type of architecture. So I picked up something on efficient nets because one of the biggest problems with architecture is how do you scale them? Should I go wide, should I go deep, should I go higher in resolution? So I found a paper that answers that and actually we've had very good success with that as well. And then the third one I picked up is just to show you what's happening in the third field of study that's not discussed a lot. So you have supervised learning, which is association of inputs with outputs. You have reinforcement learning, which is goal-oriented. But there's a third field of study known as um, you know, unsupervised learning or self-training or self-clustering. So there's a very nice paper that I found uh, on that that basically takes 1% of classified data, so semi-classified data, and gives you about 85% accuracy off the bat and then it exponentially scales. So again, just seeing what, where the room was, we could talk about either one of those, sort of progressively go through that. But I don't think we can do justice to either one of them and be sort of just forcing it down everybody's throat. So how about we just pick another day, we can get together, if this is yeah. a topic that's yeah. interesting. Another day, yeah. Let, let Balaji know. Yeah, yeah. For, for today, um, just, so you can, just so we know what the, what's coming up in the future, uh, can you maybe just bring up a note pattern text? I'll let Balaji do that. 
right? He owns the, the talk, let him do that. Um, and maybe what we can do is if this is if AI is of interest to the group and if you guys want to get into this in a big way, maybe what we can do is um, I, I can either a dedicated session or uh, what we could do is because people have varying depth of understanding on the, on the on the documents, what I could do is I could maybe pick like five or ten documents that I feel are relevant publications in 2019. So there'll be some sort of freshness or newness in the data for you guys and probably find something that's fundamental, like there's a new activation function, why that makes sense and why it's working. We could talk about blocks like Transformer, why it's different than LSTM with, with soft associations. We could talk about architecture, what is happening in there, and so on. So just pick something from every, every aspect of AI and then just spend like five or seven minutes on a relevant paper that has moved the conversation forward, if you like. Um, you know, unfortunately, most of the papers that I'm familiar with are, are from DeepMind, so I'm not sure if any of you have a bias that you'd rather not, you know, but I just find them to be very well written, very well thought out, and very effective for me, and they're easy to implement as well. Great, so, great. Good, very good. We are having... Can you, can you also tell us a little bit about yourself? So then sure, let's do that the next time, because again, we're yeah, next, yeah. Time. I have to get going. So yeah. I'll let Balaji set up, yeah. but if it is relevant, just take a moment, let him know, and then we can set up the subject. Yeah, I definitely participate, that's sure. good. So, yeah. Okay, but a whole, whole new version. AI. Yeah. So, question yeah. So, is it possible for you uh, to share so your the dots on, on some of the shared share borders? Because I want to before we go to the next. Uh, I, that's very reasonable. What I'll do is uh, the papers that I pick, I'll just put them on the meetups if you guys yeah, want to read yeah, yeah. it. Pita, yeah, it's yeah. not a problem. Yeah. They are dense because remember, I don't suffer from the thing of reading them one week before I'm reading them throughout 2019. But what I would suggest is, um, have you guys, do you guys regularly read publications? Is there anybody in this room that say maybe reads one a week or something like that? Okay, so uh, most of you don't. So I'll tell you the trick that I use and maybe if this resonates with you or not. Do you, can you pull an archive? Um, I know I have two groups, you know, they mainly focus on deep learning. One is here, one is in the UCSF. They are reading uh, thesis, you know, <laughs> every week, yeah. So, um, you know, if you get to the uh, Cornell Archive, you can pick up any of the, the papers that are published, right? So the trick that I use to filter through papers, so every morning or night what I do is, I just grab the paper and I read the abstract, and then I read the results, right? From ab if abstract is something that interests me and results are real, because what happens is this part is really sexy, you flip it over to the results, and it's like a peanut improvement, right? Mm -hmm. So it's great if that's the game you're playing, but it's not has no commercial value to me. So then I just like move on. The third thing that I normally read is the conclusion, and then I just map it in my mind is, Oh yeah, that's what I've done, and here's the unique step that they took, and that's the only takeaway that I want. But sometimes, you know, these papers get into like a really unique way of approaching the problem, or it's a subset of the field that I'm not so comfortable with, then I read the whole paper, because humanly it's not possible to make through so, much, so many of these. Right. So I try to average about three papers a day. Wow, day. wow. Well, they publish approximately 1,500 pages uh, of publications, you know, a week. Uh -huh. So even if you wanted to like just take your favorite authors, there's always something coming out of them, right? Um, so that's sort of what I do, but that's what works for me. So but that doesn't mean I have to do that. Uh, okay, so let's start. Cornell with University. Sure History, part, right? a research guy, University oh, okay. Aka. Woo! Cornell. So another suggestion, uh, this group you want to meet every week, something like that. If you are interested, uh, yeah. we can make it a weekly meeting so that... Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Friday? 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 Yeah, Friday night is a good, 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 good time. Good time. Yeah, twice a month or something. Yeah, yeah. Huh? Twice a month. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe every other Friday. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Twice, yeah, twice or twice a month, yeah, it's good. Not every, well, not every. It's usually 
Friday night. All, all yeah. Sharks don't go on day, but young dudes like that guy over there who just accepted my invitation. Friday night is good. It's a <laughs> last meeting, you know. Yeah. Uh, all right, guys. The first part of bad news is going to be exactly what he said. If you want me to come over and talk, it's not going to be a Friday. Yeah. That's just because I already have a prior commitment. That's why right. we have situations mm -hmm. like that. We've heard of that Saturday, yeah. Sunday is okay. All right, guys, let's, let's dial back into where they are because I really need to get going. So let's get back to the conversation at hand. Yeah. Uh, so this is the archive database. All I did is I put in the publication number that you want. So you can just dial in, you know, whatever publication number or title that you're aware of. In this particular case, I pulled up this paper. That's 1905. 90 means it was published in 2019. 05 means the first publication came out in May. Uh, 09272 are subcategory codes, and I don't know the exact translation, but most of them fall by uh, either the computer science, statistics, or uh, AI. Uh, and what I normally do is I go down and I pick up the most recent version of them. So in this particular case, um, oh, this thing is coming at me. I just selected something new. Um, so what I would do is I would pick the latest situation, so I'm going to click on new one down here. And then I'm going to get into the video. All right, guys, look at this for a second. I have to take this hold on. Who follows DeepMind here? Anyone follow DeepMind? Yeah, DeepMind was a hack, just be lay off, right? Yeah. yeah, they are because they, lo they lose a lot of money. Yeah. So yeah, Google fire fire the demise, you know, vice president or something. Yeah. It's still part of the huh? Yeah. It's still right. But they lose they lose too much money. Yeah. All right. So this is uh, basically how you pick up archive papers. This is an author that I follow very frequently. So that's the reason why I know about his work or how I re reached this paper. And as you read more and more, he's the guy who first did the NT paper as well as the turning paper and so on and so forth. Uh, this is one of the papers that I was going to cover. This one has uh, great insight to it. As you can see, one of the uh, edges that I really like about this paper is if you just look at the graph right up here, it tells you with approximately uh, you know, 15 images on your regular architecture, your best shot is you could get about approximately 40 to 50 percent accuracy. But with this technique, right off the shoot, with only classifying about 10 to 15 images from a class, you can start off the bat with about 65 percent accuracy. And there are ways to improve this. There's something known as info NCE, which is noise contrastive estimation, and you can see how quickly you scale up. Right? And just to give you a perspective on the depth, I'm probably putting your laptop now. Yeah. Uh, I just want to show you the conclusion, right? Mm. Right? I mean, so what you're doing, uh, how many people in here have a general understanding of AI? Sure. Oh, good. So this all will make sense to you, right? So what they've done is they've done modifications to it, so, so for, your, for your mental reference, right? So they said, if I took simply a semi-supervised, meaning I gave it some data, and the rest of this cluster knowledge is set to self-assemble, where I would be. This is if I take the best rest net, where would I be? Instance discovery is, is a little complicated, so keep that out. Exemplar is also a little bit complicated. Rotation is nothing, but what you do is you take the input data sets, and you in one of the augmentations that you do is rather than simply doing 60, 90 rotations, you start doing all number rotations, but you track the rotation numbers. It's actually a very, very powerful routine, and if you are familiar with WAT and WAT GT techniques, rotation seems to add at least four basis points to it, so that's brilliant. And what they showed is no matter what you use, this thing is like two orders of magnitude better than that. Oh, here's why. If you guys have it, and if uh, semi-supervised or unsupervised learning is interesting for you, sure. uh, I would strongly urge you to read the web paper. And back with entropy is a part of the same discussion. This is the same publication. And this is nothing but they basically took WAC entropy and they added the rotation augmentation to it. And they did get a bump bump, as you can see, quite significant. Wow. Ooh. 
rotation is also good here. Now guys, uh, just for a reality check, I mean, don't do this rotation thing insanely. If your data set has an orientation bias, then don't do these augmentations because you're basically making the supersets indifferent to that, right? By doing this, you're saying it's the same entity. So just be careful, make sure that the data sets that you are using are rotation invariant. Um, I guess I'll just leave it at that. Right? Um, and if you guys uh, want to read this paper, this is like probably one of the best papers I read this year. Um, mm -hmm. I really like this a lot. But it might be a little bit of a big bite if you're not familiar with this. So I would suggest read the preceding paper from this, which is just the CPC paper. And what it does is it explains to you what info NCE means in a more broader sense. And then you can go ahead and uh, Read this paper, it'll make a lot more sense that you. And if you just want what the NCE paper is, it's referenced by the author right inside the document itself. And there's a whole bunch section. Here you go. So it's reference number one. So that's the paper. Okay. It, it, it's a very short read, but it's brilliant. So what they've done is they've taken NCE and uh, Information bias and use both those logics together, right? So, uh, just generally speaking, are you guys familiar with NCE is a noise contrast to the best Are you guys familiar with um, facial recognition? Mm -hmm. So, you guys know how Sesame's networks work? So, the, uh, the general idea is you take an image and you basically say, hey, here are a bunch of, so I'm talking about the, the triple network, right? So, you say that, hey, Here's a bunch of pictures of the same entity. So, pictures of him. Here's a bunch of pictures that I would like to affiliate yourself with. So, me and him together should still be in, in a close cluster. And then I say, okay, here's a picture of Balaji and another group of people that I want you to exclude them. So, these are the negative samples that they produced, right? So, CPC uses something similar to that. What you do is you say, here's a bunch of samples that belong and here's a bunch of samples that I'm certain don't belong. Now if you keep shuffling this again and again, you'll start seeing various combinations of the population come through. So different images of me will be closer, and images where I am with someone will be at a distance but still relatively close to me, and images that have no uh, occurrence of me will be further away in relative terms. Right? Now depending on how you take the dimensional sensitivity to it, you can now hash the data in very interesting ways. So, for example, uh, you know, we might all be aligned in the axis of skin color, but we might be all uh, misaligned based on the color of our iris, and you know, you don't know just how the data is sorted out, but there's one clear dimension or the super dimension that will say that, hey, you're, you're off and you're not, and then you can start looking at deeper dimensions to sort things out. That's sort of how the system itself tries, tries to know me looking at me face front versus sideways versus some other way. So it's a great paper, I would, I would encourage you if you have the time and the patience. It's a short read, and if you want to be even shorter, just read uh, publication 49 first, and that itself is a very short paper. So uh, just as a reference, uh, I'm not sure what things or how much depth you guys want to go into, so let Balaji know and let me know. If you guys want to focus on, on a paper and go infinitely deep, just get a flavor of what's out there, we can do that um, as the case may be. Alright guys, you don't have to stay here, but I gotta go. Alright? Yeah, very good. Uh, sorry about that. I, I, like, I like the flavor first. Flavor first. <laughs> then get the... Get your name. Hold your What's your question? Is it very good? Oh, I'll, I'll have Balaji publish that. Very good, very good, very so, good. Thank you. No worries. Can you yes. just, um, did you write your name? I, th I think you already have my information from the last time you spoke. Yeah, there would be enough. Yeah, yeah. yeah. correct. Yeah. So if you just dig up, you'll find me. Yeah. 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 So we'll finish? We finish? Yeah, we're done. Good.